Uh, welcome to this uh, lecture in the behavioral health series. Uh, I'm Paul Glazer. I'm one of the doctors here at WashU in St. Louis, and I'm triple boarded, so I'm boarded in pediatrics, uh, adult psych, and child psych. And today we're going to be covering the practical use of behavioral health medications in pediatrics. And I'm especially going to focus on not just how to start medicines if you're interested but when to continuum if there's a patient coming to you, and especially if there's a patient coming in from a psych hospitalization and they come to your primary care clinic, um, when you should stop those medications and how to stop them. Uh, some very practical things that are not always covered in medical school or pediatric training. So for uh, CME purposes, I have no uh, conflicts of interest to report. And I'll, I'll try to point out where FDA indications are and where I'm talking about off-label medication since there's a lot of off-label medication use for um, children's behavioral health issues. Um, here's the objectives. So let's start off just by considering some of the behavioral health issues that you'll see in your clinics um, in the pediatric world, family practice world that uh, could benefit from medications. Uh, there's more than this list, but these are probably the main ones. I'd say the one that pediatricians are best at is the ADHD. They're uh, very good and very well-versed at those medications. So I, I'll mention those a little bit at the end, but they will not be the main focus of my talk today. Um, depression, anxiety will be a major talk topic, and then we'll cover a little bit of all these other issues in the course of this talk. This is, a, this is a pretty tough question these days. What are you to do if you are a busy pediatrician, primary care doctor, nurse practitioner? Um, you know, mental health issues are popping up everywhere. They seem to be on the rise. Most evidence says, says that they are going up, uh, not only due to the pandemic, but also the last 10 to 15 years of social media. Uh, we do know that Resources or referrals are always kind of difficult. Even if you have good ones, the patients and their families don't always follow through with them. And then finally, the, the waiting list for child psychiatrists can be very long these days. Uh, I've heard as scary numbers as long as six to eight months just to get into a trusted child psychiatrist for a new appointment. There's lots of answers to this question. I don't think I have the one that's right for your practice. But I think one of the ones that I focus on through this talk is just as you get more familiar and more comfortable with uh, psychiatric medicines, you may choose to start pre prescribing them yourself or deal with them once you have patients who come to you on them uh, and learn to be confident with them. And we'll, we'll discuss some of that uh, as we go along in terms of confidence level. Uh, we also have lots of other resources. Here's one that uh, it is, was important in my training and has lots of free PDFs and resources for all sorts of mental health issues seen in a primary care clinic, and that's the Bright Futures. But there's many other sources out there, so I encourage you to look into those for your clinic. So let's start out with the first case. It's a case of chief complaint, I can't get her to do anything. So a mom brings in her 16-year-old daughter to your clinic. Uh, the main issue that they have is with the school. The school needs a note for the missed days of school. The patient's actually been refusing to return to school um, since her school returned to in-person school. She you know, kind of had been getting by during the virtual school era. Um, and the school actually kind of required her daughter to get an evaluation. Um, she was, you know, when you go to see her, she does complain a little bit of headaches. She has no other physical complaints. Um, when you look at not only the, the screening information that, say, you did a pediatric checklist, uh, symptom checklist with her, um, you find out she's had a lot of symptoms that suggest this, the diagnosis of depression. She notices sadness, isolating herself to her room, trouble concentrating on when she does do Zoom classes, a lot of tiredness, uh, getting anxious when she does think about returning to school. Uh, and that seems to be when the headaches pop up is in the morning when she's about to go to an in-person school and the headaches keep her home. She has a lot of passive suicidal thoughts, just like 
wondering why she even exists or wishing she would die, but she actually has no suicidal thoughts in terms of making a plan. Uh, she did have a history of cutting herself several years ago, uh, but no recent troubles with that. She eats about once a day and describes not usually being hungry. Uh, her mom does note a uh, family history of depression and anxiety, and they did get virtual counseling started through the school service uh, just a couple weeks ago. They did go ahead and schedule a child psychi psychiatry appointment, but it was uh, for six months from now. So mom's actually desperate. She needs something to be able to help um, help her child get in better terms with the school and out of trouble with the law. So what do you do in this case? Well, one, one suggestion would be that you and your clinic get comfortable with prescribing first-line therapies for depression. Uh, why is that? Well, depression is a very common uh, presentation in adolescents. Uh, it is more common in females than males. It's around 2% in 2 to 6% in older studies. Uh, newer studies show that it has been slowly on the rise over the last decades. I've seen reports of 10 to 15%. If you add anxiety to that, you might get numbers up to around 30%. Uh, and we really do know that we're in kind of a psychiatric hospitalization crisis right now, at least in our region, with lots of extra, you know, lots of full uh, units. Uh, I know here at WashU Children's Hospital, there's a lot of beds being used at other medical services for psychiatric patients because of the overflow. So it's not, it's really kind of another pandemic on top of the pandemic. Uh, and we do know the youth suicide rate has gotten up to the highest since we've tracked it in the early 1960s. So one reason to maybe learn how to use these medicines would be the need is there. Uh, children still can have depression. We're not seeing as great of a crisis of this, but uh, if you do see it, it also presents more with irritability uh, than sadness at this age. Um, what would I recommend just in terms of a trip tip for diagnosing these things? Well, I think with a busy clinic, you're not gonna have time to screen these yourself unless it is a chief complaint. So it's probably better to put in a something like a pediatric symptom checklist in the pre-visit scales that a family fills out. Uh, and this will not only screen for other um, disorders, but it, it especially will pick up on those cases of teens who present with headache, stomach ache, um, other kind of somatic complaints when really the underlying source is depression. And I give you a, uh, an address there if you want to find the PDF online. Uh, and it's also available in other um, languages. So just in terms of starting the medicine, how would I start an SSRI? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that most of these medicines are off-label for depression in children and adolescents. We do have two, uh, Floxetine, which is for ages 8 and above, and escitalopram. S uh, which is for 12 and above. Uh, but most of these others that, you know, throughout the last few decades have been used for teens and children with depression and anxiety as well. Uh, most of them they actually don't have FDA indications. This usually doesn't cause too much trouble with insurances, although you'll every now and then you'll sit, have one do a refusal because of the lack of FDA approval. But uh, all these are generic and also can be found um, through GoodRx and other um, places without for people without insurance. Here are my two slides of very practical dosing. So if you've never prescribed these before and you really want to start, um, this is, would be a good guideline for using those medications. And that's probably would recommend uh, fluoxetine would be probably the best one to learn about starting at, for most adolescents, you would want to just start out with 10 milligrams for a couple of days and increase to 20 um, the, these are cheapest as capsules. Uh, there are tablets and liquids, which are relatively expensive though. Um, so I would recommend a few capsules of the 10 milligrams that increase to 20. Why am I starting with a lower dose first? That kind of reduces a lot of the GI side effects, which seem to be the main issue if you start too high too soon. Uh, and then I would go up to, a, after about, since these take a couple weeks to kick in, I would uh, after about four to eight weeks, I might go up to a 40 milligrams for a patient that's not responding well. Uh, sertraline or Zoloft tends to be well tolerated in t 
15, so it's often used first line. And there's the dosing with uh, the benefit for Zoloft being that there's a tablet that's 50 milligrams. So you can actually cut that in half for the first four days. And then if the patient's tolerating that, they can go up to the whole tablet on the fifth day. Uh, when should you see people again? Well, I would usually say usually in a week or two just to check about the side effects. And then maybe after a month or so, so from the first appointment just to see if it's working. If I were treating a childhood depression case, uh, I, there really is no mil milligram per kilogram for these medications. So I would basically just start about half this. So starting at five milligram for the Prozac and 12.5 milligram for the uh, Zoloft or Sertraline. Some of you may like to try uh, citalopram or escitalopram. Uh, so here's the dosing for those. Um, if you have a ch child patient that cannot swallow liquids, um, perhaps these are the best flavored and uh, uh, acceptable liquids. Um, the, the sertraline and phloxine liquids are not quite as palatable. So these two slides really could get you started and confident in treating most uh, depression and anxiety in your uh, adolescent and childhood populations. And, you know, the only other issue that comes up then is what to do about getting consent. What should I tell them about side effects? So let me go to a case before I discuss the full aspect of side effects. All right, so this is a case that um, presents to your clinic. Yeah, the medicine was making her suicidal is the chief complaint from uh, mom. You have a 15-year-old female with a history of anxiety and depression. Uh, you had started uh, surgery on her and moved up to 50 milligrams a year ago. Uh, the family missed their last two appointments to check on the medication. Uh, recently, the patient was in a psych hospital for three days for suicidal attempt. Um, the stepdad uh, read the Zoloft package online and said there was a black box for causing suicide and therefore told mom that this was probably why she was in the hospital. So mom's kind of upset about this, wondered why you, you know, didn't warn her about it. Uh, they have no psychiatric follow-up because mom had told you that they, um, you know, told the hospital that, they, that you prescribe all of her daughter's meds. Not a common thing that I hear. Here's what she comes out of the hospital with. They had switched her to telepram 10 milligram, uh, put her on a vilified 2 milligram, and hydroxine 25 as needed for anxiety. And this seems to be a combination that a few of the local hospitals in the St. Louis region are using for adolescents, especially the, the uh, added addition of the Abilify at low dose. Uh, so you actually talk to the patient and she actually noticed she was not actually suicidal when she went into the hospital. She actually had some self-cutting that she had done to relieve stress. She had done that recently to, when she was overwhelmed, um, did not make her family very happy, of course, but she herself wasn't trying to do it to commit suicide. I think that's one important thing always to do for your patients is to really clarify what their actions mean uh, because not all self-harm behaviors are suicidal. Um, she had recently broken up with her boyfriend uh, on that day of admission, so that really was what's stressing her out. Um, and that, you know, that was the first time her mom found her cutting, so that also was a stressor. Now, the staff noticed that actually, when looking at the records, you had not actually given her a refill for the last month. And when you confront the patient, she does admit she had been taking the Zoloft for two months prior to that psych hospitalization um, because she thought it was making her feel empty, uh, which is, you know, it, it is a known side effect for some of the um, SSRIs. She says she is less anxious on the new medicines, um, but she's having the side effect of falling asleep. So, um, you know, a couple issues here. One is that, you know, obviously in this case, this just because the stepdad read about that black box warning of Zoloft, it wasn't the thing that caused the suicidal, and it's usually not the case. But families are worried about that. So sometimes, you know, I might not always bring it up when I gain consent. Here's the list of all the common side, SSRI side effects, but you may want to bring it up, especially if a patient has had a history of suicide in the past or cutting. Those are the patients that are slightly more likely to have this risk of suicidal thoughts. Um, otherwise, it's very uncommon, and 
you know, everyone in the field encourages us to use SSRIs in teenagers um, because it does prevent suicide attempts and suicides rather than cause them uh, for, for a, a vast majority of the patient, patients. Uh, I usually mention the GI side effects and then the other ones I, I just really say, do you have any questions, um, any concerns? I, some, sometimes if I know a patient's family is really big into the internet, I'll say, you know, please don't you look at the average internet site for side effects. Please ask me if you have a concern or call me if you have something come up and you wonder if it's the medicine or not. Because online you'll find just about every side effect listed. This is probably the biggest hurdle I think for the average primary care doc to get over is making sure they know how safe these medicines are um, uh, despite the black box warning that's there. And this just shows you that really rare um, uh, occurrence of it and it wasn't even for suicidal attempts or anything it was just the thoughts or even thoughts of self-harm was included in this side effect from the FDA summary that made them go to the black box warning so it really wasn't a very good use of a black box and the FDA has come out afterwards saying please keep prescribing these medicines even though we put that black box out there I'm going to transition to talking about medicines in terms of context of of continuing them and stopping them and how much you would be comfortable, especially if there are medicines that people are coming to you after a psych hospitalization on these medicines and you just don't know, you're just not as well experienced with them. And I bring this up because I just recently stopped at this uh, Thai food restaurant in Webster Groves, for those of you in the region, called Chiang Mai. It's a really good northern Italian. And these dishes are at different heat levels. Um, so this one is, I would say, a three chili heat level. This one was about a two and this was a one. Um, my daughter really enjoyed these two the most. I like a little spicier level. Uh, so the three chili, uh, this is a uh, northern uh, Thai dish called khao soy, which is a really good kind of coconut based chicken noodle dish. So each of us have a different spice level that we're comfortable with in terms of psychiatric medications. And therefore, whenever I show medications, I'm going to give you a spice level for it. So starting with the first ones are antidepressants. This is really a, a, a lowest spice level of one. Um, they're very safe. Um, you'll find that, oh, I'd say about two thirds of patients really respond to these well. If you've, you know, ruled out other causes for anxiety, depression, um, these, these work very well. Here's the four I recommended the most. Um, sometimes you have patients come on second line medicines such as the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, venlafaxine and duloxine are the main ones, and then bupropion, wellbutrin, uh, mirtazapine, remeron, uh, and what they modulate. Uh, if you are, if you do have a, an interest in getting into these uh, higher level ones, that would probably be another psychopharm class for you. Uh, but they really, for most patients, we're we're going to want to see if they fail either two or three of these before we start any of these second line ones. Uh, you might find a few others out there. Uh, one I just uh, listed out of interest was Brintilex or Vortioxetine, since it has a very um, elaborate mechanism of action. And those are the doses if you ever have a patient come to you on that. Haven't seen too much of that. Uh, birth control pills, many of you may use those oral contraceptives for premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, here's one that actually has an FDA approval just because they added this L-methylfolate to it as well. Um, it's probably more expensive though than regular oral contraceptives. So I would say, even though they're off label, um, oral contraceptives are good at that kind of mood disorder where it seems to be centered around the period mostly uh, and often goes along with dysfunctional uterine ble bleeding and other uh, teenage issues. Also, FDA indicated for moderate acne as well. You may not have known that. What's uh, what's one of the biggest issues when it comes to stopping any of these medicines? Well, the fact that some of these SSRIs will have what we call discontinuation effects. These are these include stuff like um, sudden increase of anxiety, flu-like symptoms. Some can have very um, like feeling warmth in their fingers, tingling. Um, electrical shooting effects in their neck or face, uh, and 
they are inversely related in part to the half-life. So things like peroxine and fluoxamine that, fluoxamine that have very low, uh, fast half-lives in the body um, tend to cause more of these discontinuation effects. Um, other ones like sertraline and fluoxine, and also I should say um, escitalopram and citalopram are about the same half-life as sertraline, have a much lower rate of discontinuation effect. Now, how might a patient tell you about this sometimes? Well, they might, you know, teenagers often, it's very common for them to miss their medication. So if they miss a day, they might say, well, I really noticed I felt terrible or I felt sick. Uh, and then when I took my medicine again, I, it went away. So that would be uh, one case of uh, that you would know that's a problem. Now, if you want to stop a medication, it means that if you are on these shorter half-life effects, um, you want to taper off slowly. So I usually use around a one to three week taper off where say if I had someone on fluoxetine 100 milligrams, I might go to a week of 50 and then to a week of 25 and then have them stop. And this usually allows it to happen a lot more gently. Now, if they're already on a low dose, um, some, some of the low doses I mentioned there early for some of the medicine, or if they're on fluoxetine, uh, you don't have to do a taper at all. You can just stop. Um, fluoxetine does its own taper over around two to three weeks. It has this really long um, metabolite called norfloxine that's partially active um, that um, tapers off slowly. Now, as for, uh, and by the way, if you do uh, want to start a new medication that's also an SSRI, you can actually stop on one day and start the next one the next day, even if that's at a lower dose. So you could go from like, like they did in the hospital for that one patient, they stopped her fluoxetine and the next day they gave her citalopram 10 milligrams. So that's fine to that way. And that will cover the SSRI because these are all, all these medicines work almost identically, Well, they're all SSRIs and then they all have slightly differences based on some other receptors that they hit, but they're very small. They're like very close cousins. All right, now I always want to emphasize, you know, even though I don't mention therapies in this uh, lecture that much, therapies are first line for all of these uh, mental health issues. Uh, I'm just focusing on the medicines because oftentimes they will be either needed in, in addition to therapy or the family will really focus in on the medicines more than the therapy, despite your attempts to get them therapy. So SSRIs are also the main choice for anxiety. Um, other choices that you can have for anxiety, these are also one, one uh, chili on the spice level for those of you who can deal with the lowest level of um, spice for prescribing medicines. Uh, Boost Bar, Hydroxine, and Zofran, surprisingly, are all really good either everyday medicines or they're also good as as-needed medicines for anxiety. We use these a lot mainly because they're not addictive. Um, I tend not to like hydroxine as much because of the sedation, which was probably what was happening in that patient I talked about early was the sedation from hydroxine. But so I usually tend to go to Boost Bar first. And Zofran's really good if you have um, nausea or, or other GI effects along with the anxiety and has had some small trials to show that it also helps mild anxiety, uh, even though it's not as well accepted um, in a larger field. Uh, do I go to benzodiazepines? Well, really no. Um, they're, in the outpatient setting, they really have no role uh, because of the abuse potential and the fact that they really, long term, they tend to not treat anxiety. They make it worse because the patient gets used to them and they tend to need more and more for the effect. Um, can they be used for short-term anxiety treatment? Yes, they can be used short-term. And, and for a few, like, rare cases of school refusal, I might try it for a few days while I'm waiting for the SSRI to kick in. Um, obviously, in the inpatient setting, these are used a lot um, for various forms of anxiety. If, I, if you do get a patient on benzos and, you know, it's just your policy not to continue those, which I uh, also agree with, um, you want to taper them off very slowly, usually over one to three months, uh, and and that is to prevent some of the, the relapse anxiety. Uh, if you're on, of course, any of those non-addictive ones, you can just stop boost bar or hydroxine. There's no discontinuation effect to those. 
pain. All right, so let's move on to some of the other medicines that are a little higher on the spice level, such as the atypical antipsychotics. With this case, uh, you have a 10-year-old uh, come back to your clinic and the mom says, my son's bipolar now. Uh, basically, he was diagnosed at seven by you, uh, was doing well on Casera 36, uh, except for a broken arm at age eight. He has an unremarkable um, medical background. He basically was um, in a six day hospitalization and is coming to you two weeks after getting out of that hospitalization. The doctor who the mom says they didn't actually remember meeting the doctor, but the doctor diagnosed bipolar and put him on some new medicines. And basically, the mom says, hey, we're about to run out of medicines in a day. Um, it's three months till we can see the other psychiatrists. Can you refill them? So I'm sure some of you have had this very um, challenging presentation for some of your patients. Well, what medicines is he on? He's on risperidone, one milligram twice a day benztropine 0.5 twice a day. Uh, he's been switched to Adaloxar at 20, and they have them on Seroquel 50 at bedtime. So a lot of medicines that you may not either be comfortable prescribing or are reluctant to continue. Plus the fact that you figure out and you're quite rightly that this person probably does not have bipolar. And you can go through the criteria with mom and the and the son in the room, and turns out he really doesn't have any uh, trouble with bipolar. He basically had a really bad anger tantrum, whatever you want to call it, and uh, that's what the the hospital doctor called it. All right, so what am I going to do? I mean, should I should I stop these medicines? I mean, they're really strong. Um, you know, uh, it, here's the here's the case, by the way. Uh, it was due to the patient tearing up the house and threatening the mom with a knife because the mom wouldn't let him play Fortnite at midnight. Uh, he's sleepy in the room when you see him. He's gained 20 pounds since his last visit, uh, which was for a sprained ankle. Uh, mom says he's no longer hyper, but he's also not, not awake that often. Um, she thinks the meds are working because his teachers are not reporting troubles for the first time ever. Um, but if you actually talk to the teacher, teachers, it's also because he's falling asleep in class and they're okay with that. Patient notes, he's always hungry. Uh, when you ask about what's changed at home, mom admits that his ex-boyfriend moved back uh, one week before her son went into the hospital. And um, <clears throat> without looking at you, she states, uh, the, the ex-boyfriend's off drugs now, so he's not mean. So you know there's a lot more going on to this case. Uh, that's not bipolar. And a lot of those medicines are probably not needed. So which one would I choose, by the way, to go off of? Well, actually, the benztropine or cogentin is used for atypical antipsychotics if there's extrapyramidal side effects, which we'll go over later. So that one's probably really not needed for risperidone, although for a 10-year-old, that's a high dose of risperidone. So I would probably stop both of those, risperidone and the benztropine. Uh, if the Seroquel is just for sleep, I would switch to a different sleep medicine since Seroquel is really more of an atypical antipsychotic than a sleep medicine. And I only use it for sleep if I'm also treating some other definitive mood disorder. All right, so how, do, how do physicians choose medicines? Well, we really don't have excellent evidence-based algorithms for psychopharm. Uh, it's really based on what you learned at school, what you learned in residency, um, a lot of physicians will kind of stick with what their residency was, even if it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so you may find some areas of the country and the rural areas, a lot of medicines that are older being used. Um, nothing wrong with that per se, but they can have their own unique side effects and um, troubles, uh, long-term troubles. So we also try to match what patients are interested. Uh, a lot of times, like a mom will say, Oh, Zoloft works in our family. Can we try that? We also want to use, choose medicines based on the fact that we don't want to do harm. That's the Hippocratic Oath. And then it, sometimes we'll try to prescribe an, a medicine and the insurance company will refuse it. Now, insurance companies also come into factor, I think, with kind of the mini hospital epidemic of bipolar. I think bipolar is probably the best 
reimbursed hospital diagnosis. So I find a lot of patients may actually get that diagnosis just to help increase the reimbursement of the hospital. And not per se that it's the actual diagnosis. I mean, they still may have enough symptoms to need it on DSM-5, but it's not, the more you research it, it's really not the cause. So not to fault those doctors per se, because of the way the insurance companies work, but you as a, as a primary care doc should be skeptical about a 10 year old uh, coming out with a bipolar diagnosis. What are some of these medicines that are used for um, not only bipolar, but other, um, other things that lead to aggressive behavior like the patient was having? Uh, here's a long list of them. They're all on the three spice, the high, you know, relatively the highest spice level that most of you should be comfortable with. These really should be controlled by most uh, child psychiatrists. Um, developmental pediatricians are also very good at these medicines. I met a few primary care pediatricians that get used to maybe prescribing one or two of these. So if you're in that category, that's good. Um, the star ones are show which one have depot medicines that now can be given as a once a month shot. And I've been seeing these being used by inpatient psych hospitals especially when compliance with the medicine is going to be hard. This is especially good for a, like a 17-year-old patient with bipolar or schizophrenia, really well diagnosed, that refuses to take their medicine and on a regular basis. All right, what are some of these other indications for atypical antipsychotic psychotics? Well, you will see some kids with ODD and CD put on them. Uh, you might see a kid put on these for ADHD. Um, please take them off if that's their only diagnosis. It's not an ADHD medicine. They can help with some of the symptoms of PTSD and reactive attachment disorder. And now the new disruptive mood dysregulation disorder kind of given to younger kids that really do have lots of mood issues. Like I would say the most typical one would be ones that have rapid swings between feeling happy, feeling sad, and being irritable or highly aggressive. Um, that new DMDD diagnosis um, is often treated with atypical antipsychotics in our field. I'm going to go just a, a little bit through these highlights. You can stop it and slow down if you need to hit all these details, but I'm not going to focus on them all, uh, mainly because they just go through very practical things like dosing of them, and really we're not going to, uh, you know, it's not the goal of this to train you to start these medicines, I really want you to be comfortable either with cont continuing them if you're forced to or stopping them if you are wise enough to do that. Uh, so risperidone, there's the dosing and some of the uh, ways it comes as a liquid. There's a dissolvable tablet. Um, sedation is probably the one thing that we have to look out for at first and then weight gain long term. The um, EPS can be seen with all these, although the atypical antipsychotics have a much less, much, much less than older uh, antipsychotics like uh, Haldol. And this would be if a muscle group locks up. Oh, for example, I had one patient who had just come out of the hospital after getting their Invega Constance ship, or Invega Sustana shot, and she was having trouble keeping her eyes straight because they kept rolling back up. So that kind of a opistonus is, is also an acute dystonia. And you would want to treat with oral Benadryl in that case, or if it's not going to go away for a while, you could also do uh, benzotropine BID for a few few days or a week. Acathesia is another EPS, extrapyramidal side effect, uh, antsiness, feeling, and there's some medicines for that. Risperidone also does have a small risk of um, prolactin elevation, so you can get gynecomastia in boys, galacteria in girls, in rare cases. Zyprexa, really not a twice a day medicine because it causes sleepiness that kind of lasts. So if it is twice a day and the patient is sleepy, you can move it just to the nighttime. It works just as well. Uh, weight gain is also a big issue with this medicine. So um, that might be a reason you will have to stop on some med, um, patients. Uh, there are some other risks there as well. Uh, quetiapine or Seroquel. Uh, very gentle in terms of its uh, um, decrease of aggression and psychotic symptoms, but 
At higher doses, it still can be fairly well used. It does have the sedation at lower doses. Uh, and here's some of the dosing of that. Usually BID with, um, there's also a XR tablet once a day out there. And some of the other side effects. Um, ortho orthostatic hypotension is one that if you start it too high on quetiapine, you'll see that. Uh, Zeprazidone, probably one of the first ones that I mentioned that has a little lower rate of weight gain. So sometimes we use it for that, but still can have significant sedation as one of its troubles. Um, also, hits, it works a lot like buspirone in hitting that 5-HT1A receptor, so probably has some anti-anxiety effects as well. Uh, Abilify, used a lot lately in teens just because it's fairly weight neutral. I mean, I still have some teens that gain a lot of weight on it, but most stay the same weight. And it has the extra FDA indication of being adjunct therapy as add-on therapy for depression to an SSRI. Uh, some of the side effects unique to it, a little bit more akathisia than other atypicals I've talked about. Uh, it can still have sedation on rare cases or nausea on rare cases. Uh, and Vega is basically one of the metabolites of risperidone and has that once a month, like the Abilify uh, Maintaina, here's a Vega Sustaina, which are both once a month injections. And there's the starting dose. Uses the same uh, pill as delivery system as Concerta, by the way. And sedation is possibility, prolactin elevation. Uh, here's just a laundry list of some of the newer ones that you might find, just so you have a rough idea of what the dosing is for them. Uh, not many of these are used because of the expense. They're, none of them are uh, generic yet. Uh, so it will be pretty specialized psychopharmacologist who's going to be starting these. So what's the uh, bottom line for if you do need to get someone off? Well, I would say if they're having a really severe side effect, just stop the medicine. If you have the luxury of stopping slowly, I usually like to taper them off over a couple weeks. Um, with, with about six to eight days being my most common, uh, unless uh, the, they start to have some kind of discontinuation effect. If they're already at a low dose based on the uh, doses I said earlier, then you can taper off faster. All right, here's a, another case that brings up some other psychopharm issues that you will encounter in your clinic. It's a 15-year-old male with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and seizure disorder. Mom states that they just moved and that her son has periods of aggression, will bite himself on the arm, pick at scabs when he's upset, uh, occasionally has struck out at mom when she tried to take away a preferred item like his iPad or um, some Cheetos. He's more irritable since they moved. Uh, sleep is poor, stays up on the iPad. He's tired during the day, sleeps through most of the first day of school. Uh, his weight is high. Um, has always been since he's been on these medicines. Um, no seizure since five years old, but mom cannot remember what type of seizures he's had. And here's the medicines he's on. Chlorpromazine, uh, also known as Thorazine, 50 milligrams four times a day. Alprazolam, also known as Xanax, two milligrams at night. Uh, methylphenidate, immediate release, three times a day. Haldol-2, as needed for mom to give when he gets agitated. And Depco-250, twice a day. So you may occasionally get a case like this that just comes with some seemingly old medicine or even some, you know, abusive medicine like Xanax that you just don't prescribe. Obviously, you're going to have to stop these medications and it's going to be tricky. And you also may have to replace them with known medicines. For example, you know, we call chlorpromazine a typical antipsychotic, not an atypical one, because it does have more side effects. And we tend not to use it, except extreme cases in our, our field. So you're going to want to switch this out to something else to help with the aggression. Uh, and the two that are FDA indicated, of course, for autism are um, Abilify and Latuda, although you can also use the other one off, other atypical as antipsychotics off-label. Um, so. These, um, yeah, here's a little bit about the older agents, Haldol, 
still used a lot in the hospital because it's very fast uh, and safe in a hospital setting, but not very good long term because of the risk of long term EPS. And then Thorazine, which really is sedation is the main reason we don't use it a lot. Uh, and these are four spicy levels just because you, know, you just don't want to test start these medicines if, if you don't have to. Here's that FDA indications for um, autism for risperidone and Abilify. Uh, Latuda should also be on here. And as you, you can see, these are really low doses to start out with, and we want to stay low as possible on these and get, still get the benefits. Uh, we do use some of the anti-epileptic medications in people with autism spectrum disorders, not only for seizures, but sometimes they really do help control some of the outbursts that they have, um, aggression outbursts, which, you know, probably are not seizures, but do have a lot of features of them, such as the, the patient might get glassy eyed during it, or they might be tired afterwards or remorseful, um, acting like they didn't know what they did um, when they were in their aggressive outbursts. So if you have any of those, these would be, um, you know, two levels of spicy, of course, um, but some of you are already comfortable prescribing some of these medicines, so this will be another indication for them. Uh, sleep medicines, which I should put, all these are really uh, a one spice level. Uh, some of you know about melatonin, of course, and Benadryl. Clonidine can be really good for the kid with both sleep issues and ADHD. We use trazodone a lot in our teen um, substance use residential areas for sleep. It's fairly safe, can be used as needed. Prazosin really emerged as an amazing medicine for teens that have PTSD-like nightmares where they're having a recurring nightmare of a flashback um, of some trauma that happened. And, uh, you know, I usually stay in the one to three range here, but I'm very safe for those of you who would wish to try that. Um, you'll see Syracuse well used, but I tend not to use it just for sleep. And then of course, DDAVP uh, for its own unique use. So let's finish up here by talking a little bit about ADHD. Um, first line medicines are the stimulants at all ages, um, including childhood, teenage, and adult patients with ADHD. Here are some of the methylphenidate preparations I use first line. I usually will go first line to a new, newly diagnosed patient with some of the long acting um, medicines described here. Um, I tend to like it a first for patients under the age of 12 to 13. And I think most pediatricians would say this is their go-to first medicine, even though the efficacy rate's about the same for the amphetamine-based medicines. But I, um, yeah, I agree that this is great first line. Uh, above 12 to 13, I may suggest some of these amphetamine preparations just because they tend to have a slightly less side effects than the methylphenidate preparations, but um, your experience may be different. Uh, and I, I, I would say both would be first line for a teenager and an adult patient. And we're using a lot of the Vyvanse and Adorexar lately. By the way, my dais is a triple bead form of Adderall. So it has three release points instead of just two. So it lasts a little bit longer than Adderall are. Uh, and Avicio is a new 50-50 um, mix salt. That's slightly different, but it doesn't have a time release at this point. The dosing, by the way, as you know, is fairly precise. You can have starting and max doses based on milligram per kilogram <clears throat> if you choose to use those. And here's a paper that uh, I was part of writing that just came out last year um, that looks at the fact that ADHD comes a lot of, a lot of times ADHD has a lot of comorbid conditions. And how do I prescribe medicine if my patient has ADHD and depression or ADHD and ODD or ADHD and substance use disorder? So we um, talk about how you can tailor your ADHD medicines. So for those of you who would like a Paper. This this would be a whole lecture on, of its own, um, but this is a good paper to go to if you're looking for further advice on when it's more than just straightforward ADHD. Because um, I'd say 
you know, most most well diagnosed ADHD is going to respond right away. But those cases where it doesn't, it still may take six months or nine months to get into a child psychiatrist. So you might want to try some of the other recommendations that we uh, put in this article. Uh, as for tapering off ADHD medicines, actually, there's really no taper needed for the, you know, at least the first line stimulants that we talked about, just because the brain kind of resets every night. It, uh, it gets tolerant to the medicine slightly during the day, and then it resets overnight. So these medicines really you can stop at just about any dose. I've had a few teens that if they've been on, um, you know, some of the stimulants for long term, they will have a day or two where they feel more tired or maybe a little bit down. Uh, just like some uh, patients would have with, you know, rebound mood issues as the medicine's wearing off in the afternoon. All right, with that, I will stop and uh, end this time. I would say um, if you have questions, you probably could send them into the CME Center uh, and we could address them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, otherwise, since this is not a live format, uh, I would encourage you to um, check out your local resources and those websites I mentioned also for answers. Um, finally, if you are in the St. Louis region, the place I practice most is I actually have clinics in various of uh, the preferred family health care, which takes adolescents with teen substance use issues. So you're welcome to refer people to there if they do have teen substance use issues and then I will likely see them after a couple weeks um, if they do need further modulation of their medicines. Um, that usually only lasts about three to four months that they're in our system though, so they would probably return to you after they're done with me, but that it would be one way in the St. Louis area that I could help out with medications um, with comorbid substance use disorders. Thank you.